Okay, so we are going to go ahead and get started and I'm sure we will have some more folks trickle in. Um, we are so excited here at Warrior Scholar Project to have host this um, uh, WVED today. And we have an amazing group of women who are willing to share their stories. I do want to say that we have um, a couple of uh, folks from the media who are going to be coming um, today. If you do not want um, your uh, image or your voice um, to be uh, represented by those um, in the media, please um, send us send us a message in the chat. You can send us a direct message to the Warrior Scholar Project uh, account, or you can um, send, just put it in the general chat, whichever whichever you would prefer. With that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Jessica Nelson, who we're thrilled to have moderating our panel today. Jess, if you could just introduce yourself really quickly and good luck and thanks. Thanks, Camilla. Hi, everybody. I'm Jessica Nelson. I am a WSP alum from 2017 at the Princeton program. I graduated from Smith College in 2019, and I'm currently in Jackson, Mississippi, working in local government and working on several side projects. I'd like to introduce our panelists now. Uh, our pan first panelist is Alexis Blakes. And would you like to introduce yourself and say a little bit about yourself, Alexis? Sure. Uh, thank you, Jessica. My name is Alexis Blakes. Uh, I currently am employed as a data center technician. Um, I'm a computer science major. I attend school full time as well, and I'm an alumni of the 2019 MIT Warrior Scholar Project program. Uh, right now, I'm focused on my 2020 transfer and working through uh, a lot of awesome projects with Warrior Scholar Project. Um, being an alumni, so if anyone has any questions or any thoughts about what the program is like, if it's a good fit, other resources, please feel free to reach out. Thanks so much. Our next panelist is Ms. Gabby Graves-Wakes. Hi there, I'm Gabby. Um, sorry about the noise, if you can hear anything in the background. Uh, I'm a United Airlines employee, um, I'm 27 retired from the Marine Corps. I found my way back to school after attending the 2019 WST with Alexis, and I am stressing out over transfer applications that are due in a few days. No, no. new awesome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, we have another panelist who will be joining us later, Ms. Delia Kennedy. And so we'll have her jump in and introduce herself whenever she joins. Um, and so I want to go ahead and kick it off. Um, this panel is just to kind of bring more attention to Black women in STEM, especially Black veteran women in STEM. And we wanted to talk to some, some people who have that experience firsthand, whether it's in school or in the actual workforce. So we'll start off with what made you want to enter the STEM field? And Alexis, we'll start with you. Um, the thing that made me want to enter the STEM field was actually in early childhood. Um, I had a VTech computer, and if anybody is a 90s baby, you know what a VTech computer was. It was the OG computer, and I played every game on it. I figured I had gotten everything I could out of it, and then I decided to take it apart and figure out how it worked, and then my next challenge was to put it back together. And then it still worked. And that was the moment when I said, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm like a god. <laughs> I can make technology work and not work. And I took apart everything in my house. <laughs> our TV, our microwave, my easy bake. That was just the defining moment for me that I wanted to do something in STEM. Um, as I progressed further in age and interest, um, moving into the military, I worked in IT communications. So it was very explorative. So I got the opportunity to see different applications of STEM. And then that broadened my sense of understanding. And I wanted to go further. I wanted to do research and, and look into human robot interaction. And so that was the defining moment for me that I wanted to go into STEM. And then it was solidified by that week that I spent at MIT in the WSP program, because I got to be in that environment and say, yes, I fit. I would like to be here. 
That's excellent. Thank you. I know if I'm a, I'm a, have a psych background, so if I took apart a computer, it's going to stay broken. Um, so I definitely applaud you for doing that as a child. Uh, Gabby? Okay. <laughs> There's a helicopter flying overhead. Um, so the my path into STEM was a uh, different uh, from Alexis, but still similar. Um, you know, growing up, I wanted to be an astronaut. And so when I would build solar system models or international space station models, you know, I was like, this is what I want to do. This is the coolest thing ever. And we'd watch the space shuttle launches. And so one day as I got older, I decided to research the process to become an astronaut. Turns out if you want to be a NASA astronaut, you have to have a STEM degree. And they're very specific about which STEM degrees you have to have. Engineering, physics, chemistry, bioscience, mathematics, those sort of majors in the STEM field. So not all STEM field uh, majors qualify, but those are the big ones. And then I realized, hey, they also require you to be a pilot, which meant I have to get flight trained. And then I did more research and most of those pilots come from the military. So my path kind of led me to the military, into the STEM world, and all I want to do is be an astronaut. And I still want to be one, but I don't know if it's going to happen or not now. But yeah. So I have faith in, in your dreams to become an astronaut. I think it's going to happen. And we're going to say, we knew you win. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, next, I want to say, or ask, what has your experience been as a black identified black woman identified person in STEM? Well, we'll start with you this time, Gabby. If there's no helicopters, fine. Yeah, no helicopters this time. Um, you know what? My experience has uh, been mostly favorable. You know, um, I went back to school in fall of 2019, so really just before the pandemic. Um, and in my first couple of classes, I was in a C++ programming course. We started with six females um, with 50 other students in the class. And before the midway point of the semester, I was the only female remaining. But before that, I was the only female of color in the course. So um, those moments kind of push me to want to keep going. I don't want to be the statistic that drops the course because it's difficult or because I don't think I belong. So I keep pushing so that some other female or female of color along the way will have that same mindset and mentality to want to keep going. Um, and in my other courses, we've had a couple other females and then still I might be the only female of color. But I hadn't had any sort of, you know, discouragement or any sort of racism that I felt, uh, you know, and I've always forced my way to belong. You know, I won't let them tell me I don't belong. I'll show them through my work ethic and, and my determination that I belong. Uh, so that's been my experience. And right now we're in a distance learning environment. So it's a completely different world now um, than what it was when we were on campus. Absolutely, Alexis. Yeah, um, so my experience in STEM has been um, really mixed um, just because I've, I've been in technology for almost nine years now. And um, working in the industry, I do recognize that it's very male dominated. Um, there is what much more representation for um, men, especially um, men not of color. And that can sow a sense of um, like discomfort because you don't, you don't feel like you ever really relate into, into the environment. And so it's important for me to go out of my way to explore different affinity groups and different, um, you know, different teams to find that connection within STEM because that is what, in my opinion, is gonna create the staying power. Um, even from a collegiate standpoint, I've gotten so much support being a black female in STEM. Um, at the same time, I've had uh, a lot of condescending and, and negative experiences. Um, you know, I've had my skill reduced to the prospect of what my background was. You know, oh, you know, where'd you learn that? The hood. You know, it's interesting because I never told you that I was from the hood. So why, 
when you make that assumption. So there are going to be those offhanded comments and some of those negative engagements that you're going to face. But I try to look at it as a situation that's coming from a place of ignorance and that people just generally don't know how Black women even come to be doctors and mathematicians and physicists because they're so rare. It, it creates this sense of, of awe when you see them operating in that space. And so I will say that as much as there is still issues and inequity for Black women in STEM, there are so many resources and so much allyship that you will get from other people of color, other people of non-color, from men, from women, from other genders. So it's important to just keep an open mind and understand that each individual interaction you're gonna have being in STEM is not gonna be the culmination of it entirely. Overall, I would say I still have a very positive experience being a black female in STEM. That's excellent. Um, I think for me, definitely, I was um, in a heavily STEM field in the military and then I was psych major and have worked in that field. Um, in the military, it was very male dominated, um, very much not people of color. And so uh, I think that my experience has been up and down as well. Just being always being the only one in the room um, was, was difficult because I got a lot of the same questions that you got. How did you find yourself here? Um, and where have you been? And I think a lot of that has to do with the culturalization of black females from a young age, not being pushed into those fields, those STEM fields, or not being uh, made to feel as if you were smart enough or good enough to go into those fields and not having as many role models directly. And I think that that's changing. Um, it's starting with, with people like you and people like us who are in these fields and are able to stand up in front of young women and young girls and say, look, I'm here, you can do this too, if that's something that you want. Um, and it's it's a great thing, I think. So continue to, to stand up to those who, who don't think that we can be there, as well as to educate people, because a lot of times it isn't just a, it's not a, a known bias, it's an unknown bias that we have to fight against and we've got to let people know. Um, this is not just by chance, this is how the system was made and we've got to change the system. We have an, a participant question. Uh, what free resources are available for people, veterans specifically, to get certs and educational resources in IT? And where would you recommend starting for someone with absolutely no experience in STEM? Uh, and you can speak in general or in your fields, so specifically. And we'll start with you, Alexis. Um, I would like to say that, uh, first off, NatCon was an amazing networking resource with so much information. It just ended yesterday. And I really do hope that the participant who asked this question got the opportunity to attend. And if they didn't, it's, it's been recorded. Um, and a lot of partners paid for the registration, so they might be able to still access some of those resources. Um, specifically, you know, what free resources are there for vets interested going into tech? What resources aren't there? You know, there it's really, every company has resources. Nonprofits have resources. Vets in tech have resources um, that you can pay for with GI Bill and um, other, uh, other forms of tuition assistance. There are scholarship programs and boot camps specifically designed for veterans. There are apprenticeship programs through major employers that will literally teach you the job of software development and then offer you a job at the end, such as um, companies like VMware, I believe that have that type of technical training program specifically for veterans. So I would highly recommend to do some research looking for resources that directly are designed to assist veterans in moving into technology, specifically those words, because there are so many resources. Um, I would be happy to uh, email a list if, uh, if that's necessary of some of the resources that I've used. Um, I will say coming from a place of no experience probably makes you a better, a better learner because you don't have this predisposition of thinking that you know everything. You're curious and you're open-minded. And so I would highly recommend that if you have no coding experience, no technological experience, Google what makes a computer and just let yourself fall down the rabbit hole. 
you know, a computer is only so many finite components. It's not a complex machine. Once you understand that, then you can say, okay, now I understand what a computer is. Why does it need that? You know, why, why would it run without that? And, and you just have to really flesh out that curiosity because there are so many areas in tech you can go. There is no real defined path. You could literally take technology all the way through to medicine. You could take it to big agriculture. You could take it through pharmaceuticals. You can pursue so many avenues. So I would highly recommend to look for those resources, try to reach out for veteran resource organizations, organizations and nonprofits that specifically help veterans with securing um, employment in technology or receiving training in technology. Thank you, that was, that was great information. Gabby, I saw you put something in the chat, but um, would you like to elaborate or point out any other resources that you know? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I come from the Intel world, so a lot of cyber cybersecurity, intelligence, and uh, other aspects of IT. Um, so one of the big programs that they've always pushed to us was the uh, Federal Virtual Environment or Virtual Training Environment, and that's a partnership with the Department of Homeland Security as well as uh, Hire Our Heroes. And they've got 60 classes uh, across the IT spectrum, coding, cybersecurity, um, different types of uh, languages like Java as well as C++. They have how to wire a system, networking, pretty much sky's the limit there. And all you need to do really is log in, create an account, verify your military background, and then enroll in one of their courses. Thank you. And I'd also say, check out your local environment. Uh, I participated last year and into it last year um, and into 2019 in a free coding academy through Jackson, Mississippi. And it was a six month program teaching you how to become a full stack coder. Um, and it was completely free to me. I, again, I'm more of the psych background. So I, I would not say that I will become a professional coder, but it was an awesome course. And I think that anybody who takes that course or wants to get into coding would greatly benefit from something like that. Um, so check out your local resources as well. And um, we can include that in the email because I know that they're planning on making that a national model as well. So if you don't have things like that in your local community, um, look out for things that are coming to your local community as well. Uh, next question is, why is it important for Black women to be in the STEM field? And this time we'll start with you, Gabby. All right, can you hear me? Um, you know what, I think that diversity in the STEM world is important for innovation. You know, we come from different backgrounds, different cultural experiences. We might identify a different problem than someone else might, and we will have a more creative solution for that problem. You know, especially in medicine, a rash on darker skin won't look the same as it does on paler skin. So maybe a doctor won't easily identify that rash the same way that we might if we were in the medical field. And if you look at a lot of these same diseases, they affect us differently than they affect people who are maybe not of color. So that's why, in my opinion, we'll, we'll identify those problems, we'll have a different approach and um, innovation is, is necessary with diversity. Completely agree. Alexis? Yeah, um, I agree with Gabby. That was so thoughtfully put. Um, I'm someone who really enjoys researching and uh, disseminating information. And representation of, of different races, especially of Black women, is so important in so many fields, especially in medicine, as, as Gabby uh, spoke on, but also even in finance, like buying a home, we understand that unconscious bias and conscious bias are contributing factors to prolonged destitution of, of, of certain socioeconomic groups and races. And so it's very important that we have representation of color to have an ambassador 
who is actively pursuing our interests at any given time. And that's just the nature of securing resources for a community. You know, we bring our knowledge and our resources back to our communities. And if we don't have representation in STEM, we can't raise our children and our community's children and our future generations to be explorative, to be scientists, to explore curious paths that as children, they very much are interested in, but as they get older and get conditioned, seem to turn away from because they don't feel like it's for them. And a big part of that, even for me now, the struggle is recognizing that I'm going to walk into a lot of rooms and no one's going to look like me and no one's going to have a similar background as me. And they're not gonna understand some of the experiences that I've had, but they're also not going to come with the same type of open-mindedness and grit that comes from a very specific cultural background that's shared within the black community. You know, I had a friend who made a comment about when you walk into a room and there's no people of color and you finally see someone, there's a sense of relief, almost as if you feel like you're justified in being in that space because there's more representation of you, you don't feel out of place. And that's really important if we wanna bring women in general into the conversation and create a climate where real equity and real change is happening. Absolutely, such thoughtful answers. And um, I think it's incredibly important. You know, I spoke on the, the uh, socialization and the undereducation of black women spe specifically. There's already an undereducation of women in general. Um, and so when you get down to black women, it's even more severe. So the percentage of black women in STEM is so low, it's growing. Um, and I think a lot of people have started to look into that. Um, films like Hidden Figures have helped, but the numbers are still so low where a film like that is considered an anomaly because we're not highlighting Black women in STEM. Uh, there's not a lot of Black women in STEM leadership positions. About 5% of the workforce, I believe, is Black women in leadership positions in STEM fields, um, which is, it's pretty preposterous, but the way that we get more women in in those leadership positions is to get more Black women in STEM, period. And that goes to, to combating those things that y'all pointed out, um, those racial disparities and reaching out to communities and seeing, your, seeing role models out there. Um, and so I think that y'all hit that head on. Um, next, I wanna ask, how would you inspire other young girls of color and Black women especially to enter STEM professions? Alexis, you want to start this time? Sure, I can start. Um, for me, <laughs> and this has always been like an inside joke to myself that I'm not doing justice to myself if I don't do something in the way that feels most natural for me. And most natural for me doesn't necessarily have anything to do with my race, but so much my personality. So when I engage people, I am loud and I am engaged and I am excited. And I think that when I have conversations with people who aren't STEM majors, younger children, you know, right now I'm working on a project to increase the, uh, the resources for first-gen uh, first and underrepresented groups at my college um, from, set, from age 16 all the way up to age 25, because we've noticed that there isn't a lot of retention in STEM fields. Even once you get to college, people tend to drop out. And I think being endearing and being honest, but showing the cooler application, the real world applications of STEM is what generates interest. I, <laughs> short story, uh, I had a friend who had missed a workshop that our college was holding about finances of all things. And he said, man, I wish I could have went to that because I really need to get better at my finances. So I was like, I can tell you everything they were going to tell you in that class, but I'm going to use like rap math. <laughs> so I literally went through it, but using like just verbiages of words that don't exist, like urban dictionary words. Like, so if I have two racks, so $2,000, and I give you a 20% big, and you know, understanding your audience, tailoring how you're approaching people, that is going to be the thing that moves people towards them because they understand like, this is relative. 
this seems like something I could use. This is interesting. This makes sense. And we always look at STEM from a top-down perspective, where it's, oh, it's so hard. It's so complicated. It's, it's, it's so weird. And then you get into it and you're like, wow, I can solve every problem in the world with triangles. And that's amazing. And you see the world in a different way. And once you do that, I think that's really what lights the fire of interest for people, especially women who are considering STEM. 1000% agree. And uh, that was a great example and story to bring in. I think that um, you're right. You've got to find ways to connect with people. Otherwise, they just think, well, that's not for me. That's not for me. You can't, you can't connect with me. That's a huge part of, of education is being able to connect with the material that you're learning. Because if it's just words on a paper, then you're not going to be passionate about it, but it's got to be something that you can find your passion for. I completely agree. So thanks for that answer. Uh, Gabby? I don't know that there's much that I can add that she didn't cover, but um, I'm going to give it a shot. Uh, you know, Alexis is just really good with words. Uh, I'm not so much. Um, so I'm going to come from the perspective of just being super into aviation, super into space. Um, you know, growing up, there was a program through uh, an organization called OBAP, which stands for Organization of Black Aerospace Professionals. And if I hadn't attended that program, I'm not sure that I would have kept that same fire that was ignited in third grade to continue to pursue engineering, to be an astronaut, to be a pilot, what have you. And this organization has uh, programs called the ACE Academy, and they bring in kids from ages three all the way to 18. They'll take you to Delta's headquarters in Atlanta and show you what the engineering team does on those aircraft. They'll take you to mechanics schools so you can learn what it's like to work on those aircraft. They'll take you to an air traffic control tower, to an air force base, what have you, and show you the different facets of aviation and the aerospace industry. But one of the coolest things that OBAP offers and that I'm excited to start getting involved in is they do a mentoring program. So if you were ever an ACE Academy alumni or a collegiate uh, member, when you become an aerospace professional, which I now am since I work for an airline, you can then start mentoring. You can help run an ACE Academy. You can help coordinate whatever event in your area so that other kids of color can start coming in and seeing what aviation and aerospace is all about. You know, I've met some of the Tuskegee Airmen because they were here in Arizona. They were like 95 years old and I got to shake their hand. They showed me around Luke Air Force Base and we shared a meal. You know, that was really impactful to meet some of the first African-American pilots, you know? And then my, my ultimate dream, you know, would be to one day be a, a higher level in, in OBAP so that I could help once again, give back and inspire. But Delta's kind of the focus for them. I work for United. So if I could get United on board, then we can have, you know, two airlines, two different perspectives within the industry. And, and, and that's kind of like what I'm working towards right now within our, our BRG groups. So uh, I can't add much more to what Alexis said, but from the aerospace perspective, there are tons and tons of opportunities and, and ways to inspire people of color, young black women to get involved. So if they want to be an astronaut like I do, check out OBAP. Mentorship is extremely important and a big facet of it. And uh, don't don't discount yourself. I I uh, sometimes say that too. I'm not good with words, but it's uh sometimes it's not not what how you're saying it, but it's that you get your point across, and you definitely have today. So. Um, we all will aspire to be like Alexis and how we speak and get our point across. But uh, as long as we get some points across, I think we're, we're doing okay. Um, and Dalia, are you here? We uh, will have you, in excellent. Would you like to introduce yourself to the panel? Yes, I'm Dalia Kennedy. First of all, sorry for my tardiness. I had to get a COVID test. <laughs> 
Um, so it's very packed. Um, yes, I'm Delia Kennedy. I'm actually a senior this year at Hampton University. University, sorry. I'm graduating this semester. Um, my major is biology. I did the review program um, at Yale in 2019, and then I did WSP last summer for 2020. So that's my small introduction. I, I reside in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I hope you're getting some good weather out there. <laughs> it's actually feeling better. Uh, it's not as cold anymore, but um, I've definitely been in the cold weather a lot lately, so. Um, I want to, we're, we're kind of on the, in the middle, but I'd like to ask you um, this question that I asked everybody first. What made you want to enter the STEM field? I've always been interested in uh, biology, not necessarily knowing what avenue I would take, uh, but I've always been interested in biology. Then I got the, went on and was like, oh, I, I want to be a doctor. I wanted to help others. Then I realized not so much I want to be a doctor to help others, but I want to do autopsies. I want to do the mysterious side of it. Um, and it's always interests me. And I got a, a taste of it um, when I did my research in 2019. I got a little taste of, you know, autopsies. I got a chance to do three. So they let me assist and, um, you know, shadow the PAs that were at the Yale New Haven morgue. And I told myself, I can really do this. Like, I was interested in it. I asked questions. Every time they would ask questions, I would try to answer it. So I knew it was for me because I was eager about it. Um, when I began to do it. So I just always had an interest in, in biology. That's what made me go to STEM. Thank you, appreciate that. And that's actually really cool that you got to already participate in some autopsies, which is something that you're, you're passionate about and it's obvious, so that's, that's pretty awesome. It was pretty cool, yeah, it was great. It was a great experience. And uh, they just kind of talked about this on the side, um, what review is, but um, can you talk about your experience? And I, I want to that people, two people who are very involved in the WSP STEM program helped start that. And um, just want to say WSP has their hands in a lot of things. Um, so definitely check that out if you're interested in research. But can you talk a little bit about your experience there, Delia? Uh, with review, right? Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, so review, it was seven of us, I believe, that was um, all in a research group. Everybody got assigned to a PI and we all did different research. My research was um, on autosomal dominant polycystic kid kidney disease. That's short, uh, ADPKD is an acronym, the acronym for it. Um, I started off doing that and on the side, they were like, hey, if you have more time, right across the street, there's the morgue. So I went on ahead and got in touch with uh, the PA. Well, Marla Jiha, Dr. Jiha actually got in touch with the, um, the PA that was over the morgue. And uh, that's how I ended up shadowing. So anytime I was done with my um, research uh, at the School of Medicine, I would just go right across the street and do um, rack up hours for shadowing with doing the autopsy. But the review program was a very, very great experience. It was very challenging, um, but I definitely gained confidence. It's something that I've lacked a lot of when I first came in. I had the, I don't know if you guys talked about imposter syndrome. I had that going on um, when I first got there and I felt like I didn't belong, but what it did is it boosted my confidence and anything that I wanted to do that I told them I wanted to do, I did while I was there. Um, so I met a lot of great people. My research was very effective. So I was ex excited about that. I was actually sad I couldn't move on to the next part of it. Um, and anybody, if there's an opportunity for it, I think anybody should try to, to apply for it because it was very, very beneficial. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, highly recommend that. And our WSP STEM program. So if you've been through the humanities program already, or the business program, and you're even somewhat interested in STEM, that's a great way to dip your toe in the field and just kind of be challenged in different STEM modalities and um, topics. I think that it's a really enjoyable program 
Um, and I've gotten to talk to the, the professors as well as the fellows and it's just a really intense time, but it's, it's really <laughs> a good time, I think. So definitely check that out. And uh, I'd like to ask everybody, audience included, who are your role models? And please just drop that in the chat. Um, and then we'll start at Gabby. Who are your role models? I mean, you referenced the movie earlier, Hidden Figures. I mean, Mary Jackson for me is, is the ultimate, you know, the first African-American female aeronautical engineer. And I'm a mechanical and aerospace engineering major. So uh, it'd be an honor to be able to follow, follow her footsteps. Maybe, you know, if I can't be an astronaut, be an engineer for NASA or continue to work for United and be an engineer in that route, you know, Airbus rule the world. But uh, that's my role model. And um, I hope I can do half as awesome things as she did. Awesome, thank you. Alexis, who are, who are some of your role models or one of your role models? So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call them role models. There are so many uh, women throughout history um, who have made these huge contributions to STEM that I'm just so appreciative of them for laying the groundwork. But I have always been very, very particular about not having a role model that's alive because life happens and I didn't want to have to shift focus. But I will say the thing that keeps me going and I think the drive for me is seeing so many other women do it. Like I follow so many women doing STEM pages, women in physics, women in computer science. Seeing other women do it is what makes me want to do it. It's what pushes me. And then seeing them do it glamorously, right? makes it that much more palpable. It's like, oh my goodness, you don't have to sacrifice, you know, a really good manicure to be a scientist. You can be the most well manicured scientist out there. And that's just awesome. So seeing other women do it is is really the the system that I have for inspiration. Absolutely. Thank you. Dalia? Actually, uh, piggybacking off of what Alexis said, seeing so many women just in the field and, and doing their thing is very inspiring. I wouldn't say that I have a role model, but there are many people uh, since transitioning that I do look up to that has kept me going, kept me motivated. Um, one thing I can say is growing up, I did have a doctor, a woman doctor. Of, she was a woman of color. Her name was Dr. Young. And she has always inspired me because I, I would tell her, oh, yeah, I want to do that. I want to be a doctor. And she would always tell me, well, you can. You know, if you want to, you can. So I was always, you know, inspired by her uh, actually meeting Dr. Jiha during the research program. She did everything glamorously, as Alexis said. And she was so smart and brilliant. And from that point on, I'm like, man, this woman, she's smart. She has it together. She's very firm. You know, when she's talking to people, it's like any man in a conversation with her would definitely have a hard time because men try to overpower women a lot. She would not have any problem at all. So I looked up to Dr. Jiha a lot during um, during the summer and I still communicate with her and she's very, very encouraging. So not really role models, but I do have a lot of people that I do look up to or quite a few that I do look up to. Thank you. Um... I want to say uh, for me, uh, Lida Johnson, which I used to get a lot more use out of her invention, which was the, or not invention, but she made the product better um, by making synthetic um, bristles out of hairbrushes and um, creating a recess to empty the debris. I used to get a lot more use out of hairbrushes, but now I just use a pick, so. <laughs> um, but uh, that was one of my one of my heroes and role models. Um, thank y'all for putting some in the chat as well. Uh, I highly encourage y'all to look up these women and uh, celebrate their their contributions to the field. Um, I want to open it up to audience questions as well. Um, I'd like to ask one more question: How can we close the gap on the lack of Black women in STEM and in leadership positions? And we'll start with you, Alexis. I would say the first thing is, is actually for the women. You can absolutely do it. 
you are absolutely capable. You are more than capable. And the biggest thing is once you really do grasp the concept that I'm capable, I'm unstoppable, I have what it takes, opportunities are literally going to flock to you. But a big part of the practical side of it is moving through spaces that makes us uncomfortable. Even when, you know, you can't have peace and then have inequity silently sitting in the back of the room. You have to address it when you see it. It's not comfortable, it's not fun work, but it's necessary and it's important. You have to have those conversations. If you notice there's not a lot of inclusion and diversity in your workplace, bring it up, ask that question. And what initiatives do we have to promote inclusion and diversity? You know, um, if you feel like you don't have, a, it's code switching. I'd say people of color probably knows what that means more than people of non-color, but code switching, feeling like you have to change the way that you speak, the way that you dress, the music that you listen to, you don't. There is an even medium of being professional and maintaining your sense of personality, and you have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And that is very oxymoronic, but you have to. Get comfortable asking the tough questions. Get comfortable standing up for what you know is inherently right. And always, always, always remember, you would not have gotten this far unless you were built for it because there are gonna be so many obstacles, minor and major, that are gonna make you think, I need to turn around. I can't do this. And that's, it's all an illusion. It's not a real thing. You would not be here today. You would not be pursuing the avenues you are unless you were capable. Thank you. Yes, get comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, I think that's incredibly powerful. If you haven't heard that before, that's that's just necessary in a lot of fields. But if you're if you're breaking molds, then you've got to do that. You have to be uncomfortable, or you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable because that's the only way that those hard questions are going to get answered and those obstacles are going to get overcome is by doing that. So thanks, Alexis, again. Um, Delia? And the question was, how do we close the gap, right? Okay. I I believe so what what she said is is very very true. You have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Uh I was very uncomfortable <laughs> when I accepted my experiences at Yale. For one, I know that there's not many people that identify as African American, but I did not feel out of place. I did it. And I think that one thing as as women of color in STEM ought to do is extend that helping hand to help others grow in the same field that we're growing in. And I believe that uh, I see it as it's, it's a lack. There's not many women of color that are willing to help me, you know, for the simple fact that I am a woman of color. There's not many that want to. I've had more people open up, open doors for me that are not the same color as me, you know, or ad identify as what I identify as. So how we can close the gap is why don't we invite more of our kind with us? and let them know that they don't have to be scared because each and every one of us has been scared, but we were brave with being scared. So we went on ahead and accepted our opportunities. So I just feel like if I, if I would have had an extra push, you know, or something like that way back when I was in the military, I could have maybe done more and been a little bit further, but I wasn't, you know, and that's why we need opportunities like this, you know? So my one thing about me, I told myself, if I make it before any of my friends make it into medical school, I'm gonna mentor them. That's one thing I'm gonna do is mentor them. I'm gonna be there every step of the way. You can do the same things I did. We can try something different for you. But one thing I told them, I will definitely be there. <laughs> if we make it, if you make it before me, hopefully you're there for me too. But if I make it, I am gonna be there 100%. You know, may not answer the phone all the time, but. I'm a text message away. So I think that's how we can close the gap, honestly. Absolutely. To make it, you don't have to shove somebody else out of the way. You can bring them up along with you. So I think that's that's extremely important to remember. And that's the only way we're gonna ever see people like us around us is by helping each other out. So thank you. Gabby? So to close the gap, let's see, Alexis, uh, she talked about changing your mindset. And then Delia just talked about 
being a team player and mentoring and, and bringing others up with you. So the best thing I can do is relate it to what I know. And that's, I play hockey. Hockey is another place that lacks diversity. There's no people of color really in the hockey world. But the thing that we've done to try and change that is expose the, you know, colored communities of, you know, Hispanic or black and African American to the sport of hockey. Let them know there are resources to get you into it. So I'm going to take that same route with STEM. If we expose other young African American children to STEM opportunities and what STEM truly is, and we get them comfortable with the idea of using math instead of, you know, I'm not so good at math, I hate it. Or if we get them used to the idea of tinkering like Alexis did when she was younger, taking things apart, being, being brave enough to try and put it back together. And, and knowing that when we make those mistakes, it's just a step in the process of learning. You know, I think that exposure is what's going to help close that gap. It's gonna help us get comfortable being in those, I, I, I messed up environments and then how do I fix it? Um, and, and being more intuitive and innovative with the way that we approach that sort of, uh, you know, scenario. So once again, I don't have too much to add to these amazing ladies comments, but yeah, if we can expose, you know, the younger generation sooner, then I'm sure we can close that gap. Exposure. Um, I definitely agree with that. And I I want to say I used to be terrified of math to the point it took me a little while to graduate college so I say up until my sixth year of college fifth year of college I didn't take a math class I was like nope not doing it I'm not good at it I'm uh, you know I just uh I can't do math and um I finally took a statistics class and uh my professor made it so I was not afraid of math I was in office hours all the time and that exposure helps you to just become more confident and more assured to yourself. So I think that's a key point exposure from a young age. You know, I was 27, 28 when I did that. And so I think that, you know, you expose somebody at five, that's going to be a world of difference than going through, you know, 17 years of school being afraid of, of numbers, which is a little, it's ridiculous when you think about it. I was afraid of numbers on a page, you know, that's, that's pretty ridiculous, but I'm not the only one far from it. And in the black community, I definitely farther from it. So I think that that's extremely important, just being able to expose other people to these things and, and letting them know it's not so scary. You just have to, you have to find something to let people relate, just like Alexis did with, with her friend. Um, you've got to find a way to get people to relate to these these subjects and the numbers or whatever it is. And so I think that that's a key point and a lot of these really related to each other. What is it, Lil, did you wanna ask your question now? Sure, thanks Jess. First, let me say you all are so inspiring. It's really awesome just to hear you. Um, so yeah, I think Alexis kind of touched on this a little bit when she mentioned the code switch, but something that came to mind for me is of course, there's a time and place for everything. There's a time to be professional. There's a time to, you know, hang around and be silly. But I'm just wondering, um, with you all mentioning being very, one of the very few in the uh, STEM field, um, have you ever felt like you had to sacrifice any part of your authentic self, whether it be a part of your culture, your hair, your the language, you know, I know that that comes up for many people, not even in the STEM field, but just many people of color in the professional realm, feeling like they couldn't be them, their authentic selves because of some reason. So I'm just wondering if you all have had that experience. I can go um, if, if you don't mind. Um, I have, I mean, it would be, it would be so disingenuous to sit here and say, no, I've never had to change who I was to better fit in this, this arena. But this, this system and this arena was constructed way before I was ever conceived. And it operates the way that it operates and change is gonna be slow and grueling. I will say that over time, I have become more expressive and more able and more willing. I mean, it is very, it can be upsetting 
to have to explain so much of yourself because in my own community, I have to explain nothing. It's understood. And so that can be exhausting, but now I'm taking that more in stride as an opportunity to increase the, the literacy that people have of different cultures, the understanding that they have of different cultures. So there is still a lot of code switching, but that's more for the comfortability of not having to explain myself at this point. Um, things like my hair, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm natural. This is not my natural hair, but I'm natural. Um, sometimes I wear my natural hair, sometimes I don't. Um, but when I do wear my natural hair, I understand that I might be subject to some very innocent, but very diluted questions. Like, how do you make it do that? <laughs> right? And so I think just understanding that there's going to be some sacrifice, no matter what you do, you just have to make sure it's reasonable sacrifice because you don't want to sacrifice the best parts of yourself for an organization or a degree or an institution and find that it was not worth it. So I will say it's important to gauge how much sacrifice am I willing to make that's going to be constructive and beneficial for me and then put that first. Thank you. Delia or Gabby, do either of you want to speak on that? question yes I'll speak on it because I I still do this um I remember when I so the 2019 program was actually held on campus and I was actually afraid to show up with my natural hair so I got braids and then I realized oh even in braids there are going to be questions and there were but there were it was not to a point where I felt uncomfortable um you got to think on on the Yale campus you're dealing with it's not just black and white. You're dealing with people from Italy, Germany. You're dealing with people from India. You're dealing, you're dealing with people from all over the world. So yeah, there are going to be questions, but none of them ever made me feel uncomfortable. But I knew for a fact, I'm like, I'm not showing up with my natural hair. That's just too much, too much for me to manage um, <laughs> as well. But um, I still do this. If I go to a job interview, I will slick my hair back. I will not wear my, my styles that I like to wear that, you know, that I had to learn to maintain my hairstyle. I mean, ma maintain my hair. Um, I, I still do this and I feel like it's necessary just to keep the judgment low. I want, I want to be able to, if I'm being offered these opportunities, I wanna be able to be able to accept them and they are confident with accepting me. And although it may be uncomfortable or not right, I still do it. I will fix my hair a certain way just to fit in. Um, but as far as changing my personality, I, I was just maintain professionalism at all times um, until I'm in my comfort zone to where I can be myself and, you know, talk with my friends or laugh with my friends, um, you know, and I just, it's necessary. I feel like it's just necessary. It's necessary. But um, yeah, we go through it. And I've never had a time where I felt pressured to um, by somebody else, but it's something that I like to take account in account for my own self. Like, I want to make sure everything is crystal clear. I'm clean cut. I'm not perceived as, you know, something else. I always want to make sure I'm professional. I look professional. So I do take those measures. I do. Thank you both. Um, Talia has a question. Did I say that right? Sorry. Um, good afternoon. Yes, it's Talia, but it's okay. I, I'm, I'm used to that part. <laughs> it's all right. Um, okay, so I have multiple questions and um, and and they don't have to be the same person answering it. But um, one, I want to thank y'all for your time, right? Appreciate that. Um, so I am actually, I'm still active duty. I've been active duty for eight years and um, I am a nuke electrician for surface ships. So I really I only could go on aircraft carriers. So with that being said is um, as African-American, let's talk that first, African-American in the new community, uh, community on a ship. Um, I was on a general R for it, uh, the new aircraft carrier, but on a ship, it's probably like 10 to 15, you know, African-Americans out of two, 200 to 300 people in the department, in the reactive department. Um, so, so that was, that was one limiting factor on me. And then secondly, I'm a woman and a woman in a nuke field as well, which was mostly a uh, white male dominant, but, um, 
it was about like probably it was like two it was like two females per every 20 men but then you think of the african-american right so you know I, when you mentioned the question about closing the gap right and and all of the, the, the responses, um, I, I like, you know, I like the exposure as well, you know, but being a nuke in a, a lot, a lot, there was a lot of racist um, uh, men I worked with and, and sexist as well. But um, they, they, the, no matter what the woman did, because one thing I did realize on a ship is um, a lot of females, they, they overcompensate it, you know, like they, oh, I could do this with the wrench. I could do this. I could, you know, jump into every opportunity. I wasn't the type, right? I, you know, I'll get my work done, but I'm not going to do extra just so you could set me into the field, you know? So um, with closing the gap, they, they, and, and they, and they started leaning more towards me, seeing my personality and stuff, but the woman that was like doing too much, trying to overcompensate or you got women that was like always trying to leave the ship. Oh, I got to do this with my kid. I got to, and I got a kid too, you know, but I was, a, um, I was a work center supervisor. And one thing about me is like, you know, they tell me to supervise, but I like work to get done. So I'll let people go home, get the work done, you know, and they see in that, they see the hard work, they see the whatever. And, um, but when, when I, when it's time for evals, right, my eval was lower than, you know, a white male <laughs> uh, eval that did way less work than me, you know, so closing the gap, you know, I'm, I wonder how to close the gap from their perspective, the ones that's being, you know, the, they, that's doing the discrimination because I could do all on my part, you know, I could work on my mental health, self-care, make sure I'm good, make sure, you know, but coming from the other side, it's like, how do you tap into how they thinking and how to move forward? You know, I was even asked to be one of the first enlisted uh, females to go on a submarine. I, I said no to that because I'm a city girl. So I'd rather see different faces, but you know, I was asked to go on there and I, and I, and I salute all the females that signed up for it. But, um, and I, and I, but the comments and, and harass started and I heard guys talking like, you know, definitely with the submarine life, like this is a men's world. Now we got to change this. Now we can't talk about this. You know, it's going to be more uh, sapper cases and, you know, and then it, then it kind of like a lot of females actually backed out, you know? So it's just like, how do one, my first question was, how do we close the gap from, from their perspective? Like how they tap into the, with them. And then my second question was, about the WSP program in general, um, because being active duty, I am, um, I know it's more for that transition phase. And I, I was talking to another um, a guy, I forgot his name uh, during the NATCOM uh, that just passed. But um, I told him that I'm still active duty. However, I got accepted for the state 21 program. So I'm, a, I'm trying to become an officer, you know, and they sent me to the college or whatever for the three years and I'm still in um, college right now. And um, I asked him, I said the hardest thing for me because it was eight years before I started going back to school. I mean, back to the college, you know, I've been out of school for eight years and I've been on a ship, whatever. But, you know, it was hard to transition. So really my first year at the school, my grades was low. I've been on like Navy probation through the program because I'm not meeting their actual grade requirement. So I told them like, you know, will it be possible for active duty, you know, transitioning to the state 21 program to actually go through this little boot camp? Because I feel like it would have helped me you know, get ready to get back in that like school setting um, because I struggle. I'm still struggling. I'm still on probation. And um, he was telling me, yeah, he, he would like for me to try the program and like talk to him. But um, I just wanted to kind of get some feedback as far as that process. And, you know, does it does it does it work or have anyone did it as an active duty to, to try to the boot camp phase? And, you know, because he said basically my role would kind of be like giving input on how it is being um, in school already and then active duty. But, you know, I would like to actually get some training too, too prior to, well, now I'm in school already, but, you know, people that is transi transitioning to this program, you know, for the future, you know, when I am on the ship, I want to be able to um, give them that information. And I'll stop there. I have more, but I'm gonna stop there because I'm talking too much. <laughs> Sorry. No, I'm, <laughs> I, I'll take this question, um, if that's okay with everyone. I'm from Detroit, so I, I ramble like that too, but loud. Because <laughs> um, once I have my thoughts straight, I'm like, you need to hear all of this. So um, I'm going to start with the easier thing first. So attending WSP program while on active duty um, really just requires a commander's signature for the leave of absence for the amount of time that you would take off to attend the program. Unfortunately, moving forward, unfortunately, thanks to the pandemic, there will be virtual options in the future as well. So that means you can still attend a WSP 
experience, even if you can't get the support that you need to leave to attend it on campus. And then you could plan around your own schedule to visit any schools that you're interested in. Um, moving into the question about how to close the gap from their perspective. Um, I am one of those people where I understand that struggle is an inherent part of the process. And that was something that was instilled in me very young by my mother being a hardworking single mother, um, growing up in the South, making her way from the South to the North for the manufacturing jobs, losing the manufacturing jobs, having to go to, to public service in her 50s, never being able to retire, things like that. So there's a little bit of sweat equity that I just expect, a little bit of hardship that I expect in the process that a lot of people um, probably don't expect or that they tend to shy away from. It's not your job to change people's minds. It's your job to be the best ambassador of the change that you wanna see in the world. If you want to see inclusion, be inclusive. If you want to see respect, be respectful. It doesn't necessarily mean that every person that you engage is going to give you that same respect back, but it does mean that you're putting what you wanna see out into the world and therefore there's ownership in that. I will say that um, I only know a few women in the nuclear Navy like two. Um, so I know that it's a male dominated field. With that being said, I understand that it's a white male dominated field. And we don't talk about racism a lot um, because you know racism is, is still a seedy underbelly conversation to have, especially when there are still conversations about whether or not it exists, when some of us can very explicitly say they exist. With that being said, I will say, try your best to move into situations without making assumptions. Um, you want to interpret situations that are overt. So if you think, oh, he doesn't like me because of this. You should probably have some supporting evidence to support it just so that you can make sure that you're not grinding your gears, staying up all night, trying to understand something that can't be understood. The reality of it is some people just don't like change. You look different from me, I don't like it. You come from the North and we're all Southern. We don't like it. I'm a Cowboys fan and you're not, I don't like it. There are so many reasons to have friction in the professional workplace that is going to contribute. And it's sad because it's gonna force this little bit of cognitive dissonance where you always wonder, did they do that because I'm black? Did they do that because I'm a woman? Did they do that because I'm not good at my job? That's something that's going to be with you for a very long time where you second guess um, your achievements even. You know, did I really earn this or did they just feel sorry for me? Um, but it's important to take care of your mental health. I'm glad that you said that, but also try to be explicitly explorative. Ask people what they like. Ask people, you know, even when you think of command, do you like the way I'm doing this? Do you think there's a better way I could do this? Would you prefer if I did this this way? A big part of it is going to be changing. And changing doesn't mean submitting, it just means changing. It just means evolving to be a better fit in your environment. So um, I will say that it does sound very similar to some of the experiences that I've had in the past. But with that being said, I also understood that I, I'm an ambassador of change. I've had a lot of people who out the gate I had negative experiences with and it was not pretty. <laughs> and over time, just forcing those barriers down you know, highlighting like, hey, you know, I'm, this is who I am. I'm not going to change, but I respect who you are and I'm willing to tolerate it. Can you give me the same? And there's some fairness in that. So I would try to work toward that peaceful respect first, because that's going to be the closest we get to cohesion with a lot of people. We're not always going to win everyone over, but the important thing is that we keep moving. Camilla, is that okay, Gabby? Um, okay, thank you. Go ahead, Gabby. So I'm not gonna try to tackle the first two questions that you asked, but you did ask an important third question, and that is about grades after it's been a long time since you were in school or in courses, and maybe the Navy's not feeling like you're living up to their standards. Um, so I know how you feel. I have been exactly where you're at. 
While on active duty, I suffered a traumatic brain injury. I had to learn how to speak again, walk again, you know, just function in general. Um, so attending the WSP in 2019 was part of my transition to figure out, can I still function in a classroom environment? Can I continue to try to become an astronaut? Can I make it in an engineering program? And WSP, without a doubt, gave me that confidence that I lost when I got hurt. So if you're feeling like, hey, you need a jump start to help you know, review some material curriculum to find your place in the classroom, I will say, yes, WSP can do that, especially the STEM program. So I'm now the president, vice president of the Honor Society of my community college, um, PTK. I am applying to several competitive colleges here this um, fall, and I have been able to keep a 4.0 GPA, and that is forgetting how to do algebra, forgetting pre-calculus, forgetting anything that I thought I knew after high school and while I did basic college courses on active duty. So if I can get to this point because of WSP, you with your drive and your willpower to do the amazing things that you've already done with your naval career and in school, I for sure can guarantee that the WSP and STEM program will get you where you wanna be. And the standards that the Navy has, you'll exceed them. Thank you both, Alexis and Gabby. Tell I did that, did that answer your question? Sorry, yes, um, th that, that would do, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the input. Thank you. If you'd like to get in touch with any of the panelists, um, you Camilla put her email in there and um, she can connect us, um, any of us. And uh, like, like they said, you can absolutely go through WSP. All you need to do is speak with your command and um, the virtual option is there as well as the in-person options. So well, hopefully, depending on how this, this uh, spring goes, we are hopefully gonna have some in-person courses. So um, please do talk to your command. And uh, we need more, more women like you, especially um, fighting the good fight while staying in the Navy and becoming a leader among leaders as an officer um, in a male dominated field, we applaud you. So, and Gabby, I just wanna say, applaud you for going through all of that and coming out on top. Cause uh, yeah. It's just, it's impressive. You're all impressive. So thank y'all for joining us. And uh, thank you for, to the audience for tuning in. This has been a great session, some great questions. And I will send a follow-up email with uh, as much of the information from the chat boxes and as many of the, um, or, uh, as many of the panelists email addresses or contact information that you all feel comfortable sharing with the group. I will, I will share that with them in the, in the follow-up email. You all are so amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Camilla. Thank you for having me, you guys. Also, if anybody wants anything uh, as far as review, helping apply, I will help anybody apply. Um, you guys can email me. I know I haven't been the best responding, but <laughs> I'm back on track now. I deleted all 1,000 emails, so <laughs> we're good now. <laughs> uh, and I would like to add one last thing. Please, please tell other women about these dialogues. These are so important that we have these conversations and that we're able to answer your questions, but also that we're able to receive your feedback. So please be an ambassador, go forward, tell people what you gained from this experience today. We would love to see more of you and see you back in our future dialogues. Thank y'all so much, Alexis, Gabby, Dalia. Thank you, WSP, for, for coming up with these and letting us uh, come before everybody and, and have these conversations.